morning, church. <coughs> the reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 13. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure, impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, nor from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you have heard from us, you accept it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Kathleen. So I wanted to provide a little bit of a a, a recap on where we've come so far in this series, this theme, Jesus at the Centre, because it's been a a few weeks since we've had sort of a normal service. Um, Jesus at the Centre, we... (coughs) This has been our theme and we've been thinking about our core values as a church, the first of which is Jesus at the centre and the others which are simple statements which are really variations on that theme, how we practically live out this centrality of Jesus in our lives and in our life together. And my hope has been that as we talk about these and think about these that they, they do move you to action. Uh, either because your response is uh, uh, an enthusiastic agreement, yes, I, I, I believe like this is so important and it motivates you to want to live uh, the, the particular value out more in your own life, or you find, oh, I'm, I don't know how I feel about that, I'm not so sure, and, and so it, it prompts some prayer and reflection in, ask, in you asking God, well, if this is important to the life of this community, what, what do I have to contribute to that? What does it look like uh, for me to grow in that way? In other words, is there something God wants to do in me? Not necessarily about what does God want to do through me. Is there something God wants to do in me? Um, one example of that for me uh, came out of the sermon four weeks ago, I think it was, um, in terms of what I realised God was wanting to do in me. I made a comment in passing, it was kind of a wisecrack, like a, a bit of a joke, and I actually want to apologise for it. I, I said, we were talking about various visions, you know, a vision from the scriptures and a couple that, that people had had in this church, and, and um, I made a kind of a, a joke in passing about, um, you know, if that makes you uncomfortable, it's all right, we'll, we'll get past it next week. Um, and I, I was reflecting on that later and went, no, that... That wasn't helpful for anyone who, especially for anyone who maybe um, has been part of a a church community that um, there was some abuse of that kind of thing, some of the the more uh, supernatural things of the Holy Spirit, and it's difficult for you whenever those things come up because your mind goes to how that wasn't well handled in another church. Now, others of you, you're perfectly comfortable with that, and I I didn't, I wasn't aiming that at anyone, but I just wanted to say sorry for that because I I sat with that later and went, um, 
in terms of doing life together, in all of our differences and variations, in terms of uh, you know, living out some of these core values, that didn't reflect that. So for me, that was one example of uh, what God's doing in me as I reflect on these core values um, and, and who he's wanting me to become and, and how I need to change. Um, because these values, for, for me at least, they're, they're more than uh, just descriptors about what's important to us. Like, oh, this is, we, we value this and we value, they're, they're about who we're becoming. Um, and so that means I want them to be about who I'm becoming. Um, because I've not mastered any of these. Um, I'm not sort of a, an expert at, at, at any of these simple statements. Of, we do life together. We're part of something bigger. Uh, but I genuinely want to become the kind of disciple whose close walk with Jesus results in these actions in my life. That's, that's what I want to be. Um, and, and I want to encourage you as we jump into the next one today, don't let the simplicity of these statements make you think that they're somehow not that important. Um, the simplicity, like it's just a few words, we do life together, we, 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 we go to the lost, uh, it's very intentional. We've developed this culture in the Western church where as long as something is complex, we feel like it's important enough to be uh, worth God, God's attention. Like it's good enough for God as long as it's complex. Uh, Jesus, on the other hand, always pushed back against uh, complexity. He modelled stuff for his disciples to live that was simple, repeatable, transferable, and sustainable. That's what Jesus did. Um, because the goal for Jesus was never sophistication. There were plenty of others around him who were big on sophistication. The goal for Jesus was obedience. So our value statements are intentionally simple. Because they're about simple obedience to Jesus, not about uh, making it complex and feel like they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, sophisticated enough. Simple obedience to Jesus in what matters to him. So we're going to move uh, to this simple phrase, we pass it on, uh, and, and what that means for us. But let me, let me pray first as we um, jump in. Father, uh, thank you this morning for the chance to be together as a family. Thanks for... The fact that you've called us brothers and sisters together because we are, each and every one of us, adopted into the family of God, those who are in Christ. We thank you for that adoption into sonship, into uh, your family, completely because of grace, because not of anything you've, we've done, but because of what you have done, Jesus, on the cross. And so this morning as we reflect on this scripture just, that we've just read, as we think about uh, the passing of our faith and of the gospel from one to another, we ask that you would uh, draw our attention to your heart, Lord Jesus, and that um, this morning the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you as we seek to be followers of Jesus, um, who encourage others to be followers of Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. So the life of faith is not something that's meant to be kept to ourselves it's, or, or sort of held close to our chests, right? It's meant to be passed on from person to person, from generation to generation. Psalm 145, which we read last week, says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Uh, the Christian church grows or declines based on whether its members pass, pass it on. Uh, there's been seasons in the life of the church where it's been in decline. There's been seasons where it's been on the rise in different places in the world, and a huge amount of it depends on whether its members pass on what they've received from God. Maybe mentoring comes to mind for you, like a, a kind of an intentional, intentional discipling relationship with, with another person. Maybe what comes to mind for you is a classroom setting or something a bit more like this where there's a, 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 a passing of, of, of 
faith and, 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 and insight from the scriptures or, you know, to a group of people. Maybe you think of what happens in life groups and the growth that occurs when different people share and there's a mutual learning. Uh, there's a whole range of ways uh, that faith is passed on from one person to another, right? It's not just one single method or, or, or methodology. This includes, but is not limited to, adults raising children in the faith. And one of the very clear goals of our children's ministry is to ensure that parents are not only involved in the discipleship process with their kids, but that they own that responsibility uh, as a mother or a father. Um, there's uh, so some re- researchers who are involved in the creation of one of the curriculums we've uh, used um, at, in times gone by discovered these two facts. Um, if we can get them hopefully on the screen. Children were more likely, so this is the first discovery, children were more likely to have a vibrant faith if the parents weren't even Christians than if the parents went to church but didn't act as primary disciples. In other words, if you go, well, faith happens in the church on, on, in church on a Sunday, but when we come home, it, it doesn't, we don't really bring that into the home. Second discovery was this. Children were more likely to have a vibrant faith if the parents were Christians and didn't go to church than if the parents went to church and didn't act as primary disciples. If that's hard to get your head around it, it, what it means is it would be better for parents not to be like hypocrites, to kind of say say I'm a Christian um, and then come to church but then not actually live it out in the home. And and in other words, what these discoveries are talking about is the faith walk of a young person really flourishes from the investment of the people they do life with not from like an, an hour on a Sunday or a lesson or a class. And I think that the same principle applies to all of us. We grow and, and in faith not just from an hour on a Sunday or 30 minutes on a Sunday or whatever, but through the investment of others into our lives on a day-to-day basis. And, and Paul talks about what that looks like in the pas- passage that we read earlier. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, I, I read this a few months back and just went, "Wow, well, this is an amazing picture of the life of um, passing on faith to another group of people." And he's reflecting. Paul, the, the author here, is reflecting on how he and his companions invested in the life of the the believers in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. In short, he says. In the middle section of what we read today, he says, we were like a mother to you and we were like a father to you, right? Like a mother and like a father. So let's just read some of that again. Uh, As a mother, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. What does a mother do? A mother cares deeply, loves deeply, spends significant time with her child. Think about a mother with a newborn, right? But the mother also provides what the child needs, the distinct needs of of nourishment uh, for that child. In, in the same way, just delivering the gospel message wasn't enough for Paul. It wasn't just enough to come in and say, hey, here's the gospel and then move on. Paul says it's, it was that as well as our lives shared with you, word and deed, gospel message and relationship. Uh, he says, there was toil and hardship while we preached the gospel to you. Think about passing on of faith to another in this way. If it's all uh, content and no relationship, there's, if there's no life on life, uh, then it, it often won't be received, that the gospel content. But then if it's all relationship, but no substance, no pursuit of Jesus, then it's just hanging out. That's not going anywhere either. But just as a mother provides what's needed in the context of close relationship, so we bring the substance of the gospel in loving care and sharing of life's our lives with others. Um, so that's, that's the first kind of image or, or, or model Paul, Paul puts forward. But then he also writes, we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. And what does this look like? Well, it, it, he says it looks like encouraging, 
comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Three things. That is like the model of a father investing in a child, encouraging, comforting, urging. Um, in the, some of the uh, other translations like ESV, uh, it says exhorted. Anybody use that word these days? <coughs> I exhort you. You made a very tasty pancake. And it doesn't, you don't really use that, right? So, but exhorted, comforting, and, uh, and charged is the other word in some translations alternative to urge. So that's that kind of, I guess, disciplinary or more, more act, real active kind of action. So it's all of these things, though. A father who urges or charges his, his, his uh, a child gets insecure on edge kids. A father who only encourages gets entitled kids. And a father who only comforts gets kids who lack resilience. But together, it's that encum- encouragement, comfort, and uh, urging of the child, together that form resilient, capable, and secure kids. And it's the same approach when passing on faith to others, Paul says. He said, we approached it like a father and like a mother. So Paul's model for the, the uh, I don't know if model is the right word, but his approach for passing the passing on of faith, the passing on of the gospel of grace and, and the Christian walk and what it means is fathering and mothering. It's, it's spiritually parenting others. And this concept is not just here in Thessalonians, in this one, one passage. You see this shift in the language of the book of Acts. So how did it all start when, when Paul's in Jewish territory? Well, they're talking about discipling and discipleship and the idea of a disciple, which is language of what? The Jews. It, the, the disciple is like the learner or the student who sits under the rabbi in order to learn from the rabbi, walk in the rabbi's footsteps, uh, learn, observe, and then eventually do what the rabbi did. That was the, the goal of a disciple. So, so that image of when Jesus says, go and make disciples, and Jesus having disciples, that is all fine. But when Paul moves out into Gentile territory, i.e. Uh, regions where they weren't Jewish and they didn't have that language, and if Paul had said, well, we're, we're, we're like a, a rabbi to you, they'd be like, what are you talking about? We don't understand that idea. So he had to find a new metaphor. He had to find a new image. And what he settled on was the idea of parenting, of spiritual parenting, a mother or a father to a child. Uh, And he writes to the Corinthians, for example, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. The word for guardians there, he's saying you have many guardians. That was like a... I don't, I'm probably not going to explain this particularly well, but it was like a live in teacher, you know, someone who came into the home, they, they, they brought skills and they brought knowledge and practical things the kids needed to learn, arithmetic or whatever, uh, but it didn't extend to the life on life of a parent where the kids learnt through imitation. So Paul goes on and says, I urge you to imitate me. And I'm sending Timothy to you because I can't be there now. And he will live a life worthy of imitation. And so this, this core value of ours, this, this, this goal to, to pass it on, sounds simple. But putting it into practice, admittedly, is a great challenge because it's actually mothering and fathering. <coughs> it's spiritual parenting. Now, how many of you have had the privilege of, of being a parent? Just chuck up your hand. Keep your hand up if you found it an absolute breeze. <laughs> Nobody, right? It, it's, it's not. It, it's, it's challenging to parent. Uh, no matter, uh, I, I'm, not that I have experience beyond the age of uh, parenting, the age of uh, kid, the age of seven, but uh, I imagine you know, at no age, there's also joys in it, but it's not easy. Now, next Sunday, it's just as a side note, we're going to actually be break up into two groups for the sermon time. Karen and I are going to do a session for parents of kids up to about end of primary school, maybe a bit higher, about discipling your kids in the home, about investing in the lives of your kids spiritually. And we want you to know, Karen and I want you to know, if you're a parent and you're going to come to that session, it will not be a session on a whole bunch of stuff you've got to do 
to ensure, like on top of what you already do, to ensure that your kid grows up to love Jesus and marries a good Christian, right? It, because we just want you to know and want to celebrate with you that if you are keeping your child alive and maybe even feeding them three meals a day, you're doing good, right? It's hard. But we want to think about, well, what are a few tweaks? What are a few small ways that you might be able to bring into ordinary life that will give your kids the best chance of uh, growing to love Jesus and know Jesus and go the distance with Jesus? There are a few simple things we can do. Um, Most of us know parenting is, is hard, which means that spiritual parenting discipling others, passing it on is not easy either. But think about it from this angle for a second. Paul writes in verse 9, we worked night and day with you. We worked night and day. I think this highlights that the passing on of faith to others requires one thing in particular. It's a simple thing, but it's a thing that uh, most of us don't feel we have, and that's time. A lot of it just boils down to time, time with people. Now, there's other things as well, and there's things we can learn along the, the journey. Like I said, the intentionality of bringing you know, substance into the time spent with people. But just like a lot of mothering and fathering boils down to spending time with your kids, discipling, mentoring, building faith in another person, it can't really be done quickly. Uh, now, there's resources and their skills. I get all of that. But notice, I'm, I'm not here to give you a program today. So, okay, you need to find someone to mentor and you need to meet with them for once a week, uh, uh, an hour once a week, read two chapters of the Bible, discuss with these set questions, pray for six and a half minutes, recite the Apostles' Creed together, and then you will have spiritually parented somebody successfully. And pass- that's, that's not the way it works. There's great uh, purpose in rhythms. Absolutely. I'm all for that. But None of the tools and techniques and ways matter if we can't give time to this responsibility. And so for me, the great challenge, and I'm preaching so much to myself this morning, uh, is what I can say no to. What it is that I can put aside in order to make space for this, to allow time with others. Maybe one of the the greatest causes of the decline of the Western church has simply been Christians being too busy. Now that said, one of the other things I'm learning is just to make the most of the time I already have with people. Who spends time with other people? Hopefully you're putting your hand up. Like, <laughs> If not, I'd really love to chat to you. And, and no, We all spend time with someone at some level, some way, pretty much every day of the week. Sometimes it's not about making some huge change so you've got you know, way more time on your hands to do this and find a new relationship. Who do you relate with already that you can intentionally encourage, comfort and urge to make a spiritual deposit in their lives? I'll give you an example. Some, this is just a real simple thing and there's, there's many other ways to do it, but for me, some time ago, I, I don't even remember what it was, but I challenged myself to stop finishing conversations, at least substantial conversations, uh, with just a sort of, okay, good chat, see you later, which is normally the way to finish. Oh, you know, great, great, we'll see you next week kind of thing. But always to pray for the person at the end of the conversation. Now, I, I don't, I often forget. <laughs> um, and, and, of course, I'm not necessarily talking about if you've just had a chat about the weather or the footy, you know, like, oh, let's pray, you know. Lord. <laughs> but if there's been anything of substance in the conversation, the simple act of bringing that to God in prayer as you wrap up the conversation with someone, that is a, a spiritual deposit you're making right there. It has the potential to maybe bring encouragement, has potential to maybe bring some help them have a greater trust in God, but to 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 maybe bring a new perspective, something you were just chatting, 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 but when you stop and pray, it's like, oh, I didn't see it from that way. Um, I'm trying to ensure that I do this more often than not if there's been a conversation that can lead to that or should lead to that. 
You already spend time with people. We all do. How can you use that time wisely and intentionally? Um, Passing it on is about intentional time spent drawing closer to Jesus. I've, I've, um, I've highlighted how this responsibility then is, is like mothering and fathering, and maybe you, you kind of go, oh, gosh, that just feels overwhelming. But um, notice that that's not the only language Paul used uh, in what we read this morning. First of all, he calls them brothers and sisters. That's where it starts for Paul. He says, you know, brothers and sisters, our visit to you was not without results. Now, we're all equals here. This is the point. We're all equals. What I've learned from God is not some indication of, of being more learned or having a greater significance. We're, we're disciples of Jesus together. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all adopted into God's family uh, by the same, through the same grace of Jesus. And so this mindset that we are brothers and sisters, that you're a brother or a sister to somebody uh, who you can invest into, I think that helps us avoid an approach to passing on faith that's kind of always like a teacher and a student, you know, the experienced and the inexperienced. Let me, let me show you what I know. Uh, it doesn't mean that, when, that there's not something to having walked with Jesus for many years and being able to pass stuff on to those who are younger in the faith. Of course, that's important. But whoever it is that you're investing in, even if they are 50 years younger than you in the faith, they're a brother or a sister first and foremost. Let's remember that. Even if they've been walking with Jesus for two seconds, they're a brother or a sister in Christ. We never look down. We never treat as lesser than. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually always got as much to learn as you've got to learn from me. Um, like it, it goes both ways. But, you know, I was thinking about this. You know what else this brother and sister mindset does? If we think, okay, I'm a brother, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And maybe this is more significant for you this morning. It stops us from thinking, I've got nothing to offer. I'm no spiritual mother. I'm no spiritual father. I'm not good enough. I'm not mature enough. I'm not experienced enough to pass it on to someone else. That's someone else's job to do. That's for the professional Christian. That's that other person who's really good with people. That's for the people with the pastoral gifting. I've used that excuse before but friends the church thrives or dies on the willingness of all its people to take what they've received from Jesus and pass it on to others all of us and if you're a brother or sister in Christ I want to encourage you this morning you have something to offer you have a lot to offer and and I I I believe some of us, some of you need to hear this this morning. You've believed for a long time that your only contribution to the church, your main contribution to the body of Christ is your tithe or some practical skill that you bring. Now, let me remind you what you actually carry with you. We read it in verse 13 this morning. Paul writes this. He says, And we, Paul and his companions, also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. We've missed the point. If we believe that what we have, what we hold in our hands to pass on is just learnings and insights we've picked up and experience and sort of a maturity or or a lack of all that. Oh, no, I don't have all that. What we have, friends, is the gospel. That's what we have to pass on to others. That's what we pass on. The message of grace. You are a dearly loved child of God, adopted into his family. You are forgiven. You are made new in Christ. When we bring this to a brother or sister who's maybe forgetting it for some reason, who's struggling, who maybe is getting too proud and too puffed up, when we bring this, we pass on the most valuable thing, maybe the only valuable thing that we hold in our hands. That's the gospel. 
But Paul also goes a step further. He says, yeah, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But he also says this, not only that, not only we're equals in the faith, carrying the God, he says, we're, even, even though as apostles of Christ, we, me and my companions, could have asserted our authority, instead we were like young children among you. What, what does he mean there? Well, the word translated here as children is sometimes translated as gentle. And the Greek, it's the Greek word for infant. He's saying they didn't come to the, the Christians, the people in Thessalonica, um, just to come and tell them what to do. Hey, look, we know what you've got to do here. Boom, 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 boom. They came to them gently. They came tenderly alongside them. They came to meet them where they're at. When you mentor or, or disciple or invest time into someone or use the time you spend with them, to, to encourage and comfort or urge in the gospel. When you do that, you serve the person. You take the approach of if there's any way I can help you in the place that you're at, come alongside you. Any way I can encourage or comfort or urge, I'll do that. Not as one who's older, not as one who's better, not even as just an equal, but as a servant, even like an infant, just gently coming alongside Paul says that was our approach. So what's the, uh, my question for you this morning is what's the Lord stirring in you? Uh, is there someone who's been on your mind this morning, someone he has positioned you to, to pass it on to or a group of people or so, those you do life with? I, I want to close with a, a couple of images and metaphors um, just to help us to think about this in a helpful way and not feel... Um, either unable or, or, or overburdened or like we, we don't have anything to take away with us this morning. Um, the metaphor, of course, that naturally comes to mind when we talk about passing it on um, is passing the baton. I think that's actually, yeah, the logo there is like the passing of the baton. So you, your, your mind may go to the 4x100 uh, metre relay at the Olympics or maybe your kid's school athletics carnival where the baton gets dropped a few more times. Um, Right, the, the, the race and you pass the baton and it gets carried by the next person. Um, and you and I know in those scenarios that passing of the baton from one to another is so crucial, right? If the baton gets dropped, there's a lot of catching up to do in the race when it gets picked up again. Now, I think it's a good metaphor. Um, I mean, we've got to pass the baton on, especially to the next generation. But it's also, in my mind... Not the best metaphor, even though I've used it up there. Uh, partly because one of the greatest challenges for Christians in the West is that we are incredibly risk-averse. We're scared to do anything that might result in failure, like that's not safe, that's not guaranteed, and we, we feel the baton is safe in our hands. If I try to pass it, it might get dropped. If I let it go, it might fall to the ground. What if I try to invest in someone... And it's not really concrete with a program with 10 steps. And so in the end, they just walk away from Jesus anyway. That, will, that, that, that feels like a risk. And we've got to overcome that risk aversion. We've got to take risks. We've got to trust God. But I also think that the baton metaphor is flawed because when we pass it on, we don't... I wish I had a baton. Can I... Is there like a Bible? Okay, here we go. Yep. Microphone's good. With, thank you. When we pass the baton on, we don't actually lose what we had in our hand, do we? That's why I think the metaphor is flawed in, in this regard when we talk about passing on the gospel, passing on the faith that we've received. Think about another baton of sorts then, another uh, thing that, that comes from the Olympics, not the one that's used in a race but the one that's used in a celebration at the Olympics, the, the torches that carry the Olympic flame. When one person passes the flame to the next person, like if, if Rhiannon Howard, do they lose that flame? It stays with them. Are they rushed? Who, who's seen the, the Olympic ceremony, the celebration where the flame goes from one to the next and eventually it lights up that big cauldron? I still remember it from the year 2000. I think it was Kathy Freeman who lit, lit the, um, the final one. Um, as they're going along, they're kind of enjoying the ride. Are they rushed? 
No. Are they requiring such precision at the handover that if they get that wrong, it's like, oh my gosh, we've mucked it up? No. The Christian walk, yes, is described at a race, as, as a race at times. And Paul, Paul talks about it as a race and running your race. But we also need to think about this as a celebration. Not one where there's always just great pressure and it's like, oh, if I don't get it right, I'm going to mess it up. But as a celebration, and as part of that celebration, we get the enjoyment of passing on the flame we've received from one to another. doesn't put our flame out. If anything, it, it, it helps it burn brighter. And Jesus has won the race. That's the good news. Jesus has won the race. The message of what he's achieved for us is powerful enough to do the work. The message itself, the gospel we carry, is powerful enough to bring change and bring life in someone's life. Our job is just to pass it on.